Cheng Li and the Silk Road Caravan, Chapter 7 The next instant, Cheng Li found himself standing alone in a swirl of anger as Fourth Brother swaggered away to collect the two donkeys. Here he'd caught Fourth Brother with stolen goods, stolen from the very man who helped him and given him a job. Yet, Cheng Li thought, I don't dare say a word. He tried to breathe slowly. He talked to his spirit father. He thought of old Cook. Useless. All useless. He remained furious at Fourth Brother, but realized there was nothing he could do. Scowling, he watched the older boy present the donkeys to Dakshesh and Sudarshna with a flourish. Here, my royal friends, are your mighty steeds. With a grin, he reached out and helped Dakshesh and then Sudarshna mount their donkeys. Cheng Li nodded to the group. I'll be with you in a minute, he called and turned away. He walked in a long, slow circle, shoving at stones with his foot and shoving at the thoughts in his mind. I must calm my anger before I go back to the princess, he thought. He knew it was Fourth Brother's fast talking that had allowed him to have this special day, but with the same ease Fourth Brother's words had also disposed of stolen property. Fourth Brother rattled off any words at all to get whatever he wanted from people. Cheng Li knew that, had known it all along, but today those words had yanked him up from the best experience to down to the very worst. He kicked another stone and pounded the air with his fist, violently at first, and then softer and softer, forcing his temper under control. Let's go, Dakshesh called. I'm coming, Ching Li answered. Everyone seemed to feel the change of mood as they started off with heavy, labored plodding. The horses, the donkeys, even El Khalid put their feet down in slow, dragging rhythm. Even the imperial guards ambled slowly along beside them. Tired, thought Ching Li. We are all so tired. He surely was exhausted by the day of fantasy and friendship, and then the crash back into the depths of reality. His goal now was to return the princess to the care of Amma and get himself back to the familiar routine of his chores. He walked in the lead, looking at nothing, and saw out in front of him with the fuzziness of a fading memory the five of them back on the dunes, climbing, laughing, and talking like ordinary friends. The only real friend he'd ever had was Little Limp, and Cheng Li hadn't even thought of him in weeks. Little Limp drew his thoughts to Old Cook, and his stomach began to ache. Could it be, he wondered, that Mei Ling loved her, Amma, the way he loved Old Cook? Like the mothers they didn't remember? His eyes felt uncomfortably hot. Too much sun and sand, that was all. Thoughts of Amma and Old Cook reminded him of the jade he carried in his pouch, and the jade made him think again of his father. It was too soon to expect anyone to remember him. The far west was where they had lived. But people moved from place to place, and someone somewhere might recall Inspector Chao Chang Wan. The swaying of the camel plodding behind him rocked his thoughts in an endless rhythm. Mei Ling, friend. Fourth brother enemy. Father, forgotten. Father, remembered. Possible? Impossible. The idea swayed, bumped, and slid to the beat of the camel's soft, plodding feet. Halfway to the caravan field, the wind came. Oh, no, Cheng Li hollered to the wind. Why have you come back to torment me? I'm doing what you want. I'm... But this wind picked up the sand and twirled it around the camel's legs, and the camel felt it. El Khalid pulled back against the lead rope, groaning and complaining. Not a spirit wind this time, for everyone felt it. What's wrong with you? Cheng Li snapped at El Khalid. He looked up at Mei Ling on her padded saddle. Both her hands gripped the long hair of her camel's shaggy hump as she kept her balance against the beast's endless swaying. Something's bothering him. He didn't like act like this earlier, Mei Ling called down. It's the wind. Look, Cheng Li said, pointing to a narrow wall of sand that snaked across the path in front of him, sweeping slowly closer, inches off the ground. The sand danced higher and higher until it swirled in front of his eyes. Through the dancing sand, distant ghost flecks moved, trailed, and disappeared. Puzzled, Ching Li blinked and pulled back from the wind. Suddenly the sky darkened and shouts sounded across the desert. Sandstorm! Take cover! Storm! screamed the princess. Take cover! Under what? She ducked her head down against El Khalid's strong neck. There's nothing on this entire desert taller than my knee. The sand will bury us! Everyone dropped to the ground and pushed their animals down, too. The donkeys, horses, and camel all instinctively tucked their faces under their bodies or into the ground, covering eyes, mouth, and nostrils. A wall of solid yellow swept toward them. "'Grab the saddle blankets!' shouted one of the soldiers. "'Get down by the animals! Turn your back to the wind! Do it now!' The howling of the wind swallowed his voice. The wall of sand burst in an explosion of gravel lifted from the desert floor. Cheng Li shoved the princess down just as the hissing sheet of yellow wind tore at them, swirling, whining, full of grit. The wind ripped at his hands and clawed his jacket. He blinked his eyes and the ground rose and fell, appearing and disappearing in front of him. Get in here, 
a hoarse whisper, barely recognizable as the princess's, called out from under the blanket. Ching Li saw her lift a corner, and he dove under, pulled the blanket tight, and slammed his eyes shut. He coughed, sand gritted between his teeth. They waited, rocked by wind. The fine sand slid under his, the blanket, under his clothes, and sifted into his eyes in spite of the rag over his face. They waited. Ching Li tried not to breathe. They waited. The howling w lowered its pitch. They waited. The screaming wind sank in silence. A shiver, a scratch. The sounds of life slowly emerged out of the packed and rearranged sand. Cheng Li pulled the princess out from the mound of sand that had piled over them. He laughed. Mei Ling cried. The sand matted their bodies and plastered itself on both their faces. Cheng Li coughed to clear his throat. The princess shook her head and sand cascaded down onto her shoulders. She looked at him and laughed through tears. We're all right, she said. We're really all right. I've survived my first sandstorm. Let's go help the others. She led the way to where the others were digging out, and together they straggled homeward toward the caravan, one behind the other. Tired as he was, Cheng Li found an enormous new thought in his head. People can change. The princess, bossy, selfish, proud, for just a short time had been a friend, and now after the storm, she'd actually helped. He wondered if changes could last, but he didn't have time to ponder the idea, for out of somewhere came a new sound, soft and distant, interrupting his thoughts. Louder sounds, gruff and strident, demanded his attention. Ahead of them, where a black silhouette should have shown the long line of their caravan, Cheng Li stared. The royal soldiers pulled to a stop. El Khalid hummed in distress. Instead of an orderly caravan, animals milled about unattended, heading out into the endless desert. Men ran back and forth screaming. Master Fong's flag lay toppled on the ground. Arrows flew, fires burned. The caravan's being attacked, the soldiers yelled at Cheng Li. Robbers! They used the storm to hide their moves. The four soldiers grabbed their bows and arrows and shouted orders. Stay here, yelled one. The fight is not over. Get your animals down, all of them, yelled another. Get the princess out of sight. Get her camel down. The men galloped off toward the chaos. Scrunched down behind their animals, Cheng Li and the others peeked out to watch the action. He could hear the shrieks of men and animals, the zing and thud of countless arrows, but he couldn't tell which way the arrows were flying nor who was being hit. You can look, Cheng Li called to Dakshesh. They're too busy to notice us. Even from the distance, they could see that the attack had been aimed at the carts of the princess. The bandits circled on their ponies, their arrows keeping away the defenders. Others crawled over the royal carts, pulling out whatever attracted them. The dowry cart lay on its side, and thieves stuffed loot into bundles, loading up their ponies. A woman, it must be Ama, could be seen riding away behind a man on horseback, her distraught voice piercing the air. Put me down! I must serve my princess! Let me down! No one paid attention to Amma's wails. The horse with two riders disappeared in the distant haze. Shivering with cold and fear, Cheng Li waited in the growing dusk and watched until all the attackers withdrew toward the distant mountains. Dakshesh stood up and silently led the group across the gravel to their camp. Dakshesh and his sister looked over the damage to the carts as Cheng Li and Fourth Brother stood in silent disbelief. The dowry cart lay toppled and empty. The cooking cart was full of smashed and scattered cookware, and Cook himself was sat cringing in a corner, white as a ghost but uninjured. The princess's own red and gold cart lay wrecked beyond repair, a sign, thought Cheng Li, of the attacker's frustration at finding no princess. In revenge, the princess's driver and Amma had both been captured. Just like my father, thought Cheng Li, they're gone. People disappear in the desert. Old Cook said so. No, he yelled. No, 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 no. Looking around, he noticed a makeshift circle set up to care for the wounded. We've got to find Master Fong and see how we can help, Cheng Li said as he headed for the circle. There he found the soldiers from the princess's dowry cart, wounded but still alive. Countless injured men lay collapsed in the circle, eyes wide with fear. Moving from one man to the next, Master Fong, with his helper, Uncle Tao at his side, carried bowls of precious water, torn cloth, and words of comfort. Uncle Tao knew all about medicines and ointments made from the plants he had collected and now his knowledge was desperately needed. As best they could, the two men washed the wounds and softened small pellets of evil-smelling medicine, with which they smothered each wound. Cheng Li bent over to help when the voice of the princess pierced the air. It's all your fault, Mei Ling picked her way among the wounded, coming up beside Cheng Li. The emperor will be furious. My new husband will not want me now. If you hadn't gotten us permission to go to the celebration, we would have been here and all my soldiers could have fought in the battle. And Amma, my Amma... Her voice tightened and rose as she realized that everything she cared about was gone. How could you leave us with no protection? 
Ching Li and Fourth Brother stood silent. Unable to talk back or defend themselves, they looked at each other and then down at the ground. For once, even Fourth Brother had no words. He dared not argue with the princess. Behind them, Ching Li could hear the voice of Master Fong as he moved through the debris, checking the wounded, giving an order here and an encouraging word there. He must have heard Mei Ling's hysterical voice, for he soon came forward to join them. Sand still clung to his bushy eyebrows, and blood had dried where it had splattered across his blue jacket. "'You are looking at a disaster, young lady,' he said, his voice sharp with exhaustion. "'For the second time on this trip, it is my men who saved your life. Had you been here, you too would now be prisoner of some unknown tribe.' The princess turned her back on the master and stamped her foot. Angry now, Master Fong kept talking. Life is hard sometimes, very hard, and all you can do is pick up and go on. Because my men took you to the celebration, you have survived. He pointed to the remaining cooking cart. Go to that cart with your two young servants and think about what I say. My men have saved your life. The look on Master Fong's face forced Mei Ling to obey. Cheng Li, still staring at the ground, grinned. Master had called them his men. He didn't have long to enjoy the compliment, though. Master Fong turned to fourth brother and called Cheng Li to join them. The princess was given over into our care. She is in grave trouble now, with a ma gone, her driver vanished, and her soldiers wounded. You two, he nodded to fourth brother and Cheng Li, you two now have less work, as some of your animals have been stolen and others have died tonight. You have always worked well together, so now add your duties to the safety of the princess and her two young servants. We must show our emperor that we did our best to deliver her as instructed, in spite of the dangers that surround us. Master's words made Cheng Li wince, but he nodded to show that he had heard. His thoughts, however, did not agree. How could he possibly work with Fourth Brother, now that he knew about the older boy's thieving? He didn't even want to be near him, but Cheng Li could not explain that to Master. Instead, he stood there and shivered. The storm, the attack, and now the order to work with that thief, it was just too much. His stomach lurched and a chill raced down his back. He shoved his hand over his mouth and bolted away to a clump of desert thorn. His stomach lurched again, and he heaved and heaved. When there was nothing left to throw up, he kicked sand over the disgusting mess and crumpled to the ground. Tears mingled with the sand still on his face. His energy disappeared. He curled into the sand and lay still. 